Chapter 1, Section 1.2. Researchers normally begin with a question about a population. A population encompasses the entire set of individuals of interest in a particular study. Examples of a population include the entire student body at Southwestern College, individuals with autism, musicians, Republicans, etc. As you can imagine, the size of a population varies, but is often quite large. Because populations are quite large, they are rarely used in conducting research. Instead, researchers use samples, a subset of a population, to conduct research. A sample, however, must be representative of the larger population from which it is drawn to be effectively used in research. In other words, the samples we use to conduct our research should look similar to the population, just smaller in size. To illustrate, if the ratio of males to females of the Southwestern College student population of 22,000 is 45% to 55%, then our sample should demonstrate a similar proportion of males to females. Incidentally, the statistical no notation to express the size of a population is capital N and lowercase n to denote the size of a sample. Now let's consider the following. If the population of interest were the students at Southwestern College, and let's say the size is equal to 22,000 students, and we selected the students in this online course to serve as a sample, and our sample size is equal to 45 students. Do you think the conclusions that we draw based on that sample could be generalized to the larger population? If you answered no, you are correct. Although the students in this class serve as a sample of the larger Southwestern College student population, collectively they would not be representative because the sample would not include representation of face-to-face -face students or all academic majors. Therefore, as researchers, we must attend to selecting representative samples when conducting research to ensure the conclusions we draw can be generalized to the larger population of interest. Incidentally, this is the process we refer to as inferential statistics. To best, the best way to achieve this objective of obtaining a representative sample is to utilize random sampling techniques that ensure all members of the population have an equal chance of being selected. Now, it should be understood that most research utilizes samples instead of entire populations because we are often limited in the access to all members of a population and because we are often limited in the resources such as time and money. Figure 1.1 illustrates the relationship between a population and sample. As previously stated, our research begins with a general question about the population. For example, we may pose the following question. Do college students learn better by studying text on printed pages or on a computer screen? To answer such a question, we need to select a sample of individuals that either self-report using either type of text or create two conditions where individuals are assigned to print text and the other group of individuals are assigned to computer-based text. So in this example, we may state that the larger population of college students consist of 1,000 individuals. And we select a sample of 30 individuals. And those 30 individuals are then assigned, randomly assigned to condition one, which is um, the print text. And then the other sample of 15 individuals are exposed to the computer text. Note that again, lowercase n is the size of the sample. The subnotation of 1 and 2 are simply labels, sample 1 versus sample 2. So again, we started with a sample of 30 total, and then we evenly distributed them into these two conditions. 
Again, notice that we are not using all members of the population to answer a research question. Let's say after 30 minutes we collect quiz scores for the two samples. We would then analyze those results and generalize our conclusions back to the population. Let's say that the results indicate that students perform better when studying print text. Our generalized conclusions would state that based on the sample data, all college students would benefit from studying print text versus computer text. In most instances, our results lead to new research questions and the cycle continues. For example, we may be interested in knowing if these results would be the same for elementary school students and therefore we'd begin with the new population and continue with the study using the sample. We would conduct the study, general, um, analyze the results, and generalize that information back to the population. Variables and data. Variables are defined as a characteristic or condition that changes or has different values for different individuals. Examples include height, weight, gender, major, religious affiliation, political affiliation, GPA, income, race, IQ, etc. As researchers, we measure and observe these variables and generate data. If I were to collect information on all of your majors, I would create a data set of approximately 45 raw scores. Note that the text refers to the word datum. For our purposes, I will use the term score or raw score to denote a single data point, measurement, or observation. Normally, a raw score is denoted by a variable such as x or y. These variables are simply placeholders for the variable that we are studying. Now, give some thought to the situation of collecting the data I described before. Here's an example of the data uh, would look like if I collected this information from you as students. It would be randomly collected, and let's say the first student was a social major, then a psych major, psych major, administration of justice, political science, anthropology, sociology, so on and so forth. The list would go on for 45 observations. And now I want you to consider the following questions. Is the raw data easy to work with? Does it help in detecting patterns? What do you think we would need to do with this data to make it easier to read and use? All these questions are precursors to chapter two, which is referred to as frequency distributions but also should help you see the application of descriptive statistics, which refers to the process of organizing and summarizing data, which we'll discuss in greater detail in subsequent slides. Parameters and statistics. Now that we understand the definitions of populations, samples, and variables, we now need to learn how to differentiate data from populations and samples. As you can see from the slides, from this slide, excuse me, the terms parameter and statistic essentially share the same definition. The difference is that parameters represent measurements or observations from populations, whereas statistics represent measurements or observations from samples. So if I were to state that capital N is equal to 22,000, and n, lowercase n, is equal to 100, we would understand that the value of 22,000 is a parameter because it came from the population, and the value of 100 is a statistic derived from a sample. Recall the notation of capital N denotes the size of a population, and lowercase n denotes the size of a sample. Similarly, in Chapter 3, we'll learn the notation and equations for computing the mean of a sample and a population. Briefly, the Greek letter mu represents the mean of a population, and x represents the mean of a sample. Therefore, if we were reporting the average age of the entire Southwestern college population, 
and of a sample of 100 students from Southwestern College, we would write mu is equal to 26 and x is equal to 23. The mu is understood as a parameter and x is a statistic. A way to help you distinguish the two is, to, is by remembering p for p, parameter for population, and s for sample, or excuse me, S for S, or statistic for a sample. Descriptive and inferential statistics. In lecture 1.1, I introduced the concepts of descriptive and inferential statistics and illustrated how the textbook is divided into these major categories. Here we see the definition of each. Again, descriptive statistics enables us to simplify data by organizing and summarizing it. We organize by creating tables and graphs, as we will see in Chapter 2, and we summarize it by reporting values such as the mean, or averages, which we'll cover in Chapter 3. However, descriptive statistics do not allow us to draw final conclusions. We must engage in inferential statistics to do this. Again, Inferential statistics entails the use of samples to draw conclusions about a population. If we detect differences in the descriptive statistics, then we must determine if those differences are due to sampling error, also known as margin of error, or to statistical significance, meaning that the difference is too large to be contributed to error. To help you better understand the term inferential statistics, Consider the definition of the word infer. To infer means we draw conclusions from evidence. Our evidence will derive from our sample data, and we will draw conclusions that can be generalized to the population from which those samples were drawn. Sampling error. Sampling error is defined as the natural discrepancy between sample statistics and population parameters. In other words, it represents the difference between what is observed in a sample and what actually exists in the population. For example, think of daily weather forecasts. The daily high is determined by past observations, but we know they may not illustrate exactly what the actual high reaches on a particular day. The difference between the prediction and the actual high is referred to as the margin of error or sampling error. Please note that the word error in this case does not imply a mistake. Instead, it is simply an illustration of a discrepancy or difference. Figure 1.2 is an example of sampling error. In the circle, we have the parameters of a population of interest. The population size is equal to 1,000 individuals and these are the parameters coming from that particular population. In the rectangle on the left, we have a sample of five students. And sub one is equal to five. Notice that the statistics that represent these five students are not identical to the population parameters. Here are the sample statistics. The average age is 19.8. The population average age is 21.3. Again, the average IQ for our first sample is 104.6. For the population, it's 112.5. Similarly, in the rectangle on the right, we have a different sample of five students. This is our sample two is equal to five individuals. Their statistics also differ not only from the population, but also from the first sample. As researchers, our job is to determine if these differences are attributed to sampling error, the natural discrepancy between the sample statistic and population parameter, or because there is something uniquely different about the samples. Incidentally, why do you think sample statistics naturally differ from the population? The reason is that samples do not include all extreme scores. 
Extreme scores affect summative values such as the average and standard deviation. In other words, the range of scores is much larger in a population than in any particular sample. We'll discuss this more in Chapter 3. Finally, Figure 1.3 shows an overview of a general research situation and demonstrates the role of descriptive and inferential statistics. This is the basis of what this entire course is all about. Earlier, we posed the following research question. Do college students learn better by studying text or print pages, excuse me, text on print pages or on a computer screen? To answer this question, the researcher conducted an experiment where two samples of 15 students each were selected from the population. Students in sample A were given printed pages of their textbook to study for 30 minutes, and the students in sample B were given the, the same text on a computer screen. So again, our population size is equal to 1,000 individuals. Sample 1 is equal to 15 individuals, and sample 2 is equal to 15. Next, all participants were given a multiple choice test to evaluate their knowledge of the material. At this point, the researcher has two sets of data. Here we see the raw data points for each student, for sample A and for sample B. Again, we have 15 students in each condition. As you can imagine, the raw data isn't very useful in detecting differences, so we use descriptive statistics to organize and summarize each data step set. Excuse me. In step two, we see that the data has been organized into a frequency distribution, where the x-axis denotes the range of test scores and the height represents the frequency or how often each score occurred. That information is then summarized into one data point, the mean or the average. Now, we can ask ourselves, do we see a difference between the groups? The answer is yes. We see and conclude that there is indeed a four-point difference in the average score between the conditions, where sample A scores are higher on average compared to the scores in sample B. But does this mean that the printed pages are better than computer page, screen pages? To answer this, we must engage in inferential statistics to scientifically interpret the outcomes. We would need to perform a statistical test to determine if those four points is large enough for us to support the idea that the text, whether print or computer, are indeed statistically significantly different. We can't just draw conclusions on the face value difference that we see here of four points. Therefore, we must determine if the four point difference is due to sampling error or due to the difference in treatment conditions. More specifically, we are differentiating between the following two interpretations. One, there is no real difference between the two study methods, and the four-point difference is simply due to chance or sampling error. Or two, there really is a difference between the two study methods, and the four-point difference was caused by the different methods of study. In short, our job is to determine if the detected difference is due to chance or to statistical significance. Statistical significance means that the difference is too large to be explained by chance and is most likely due to the independent variable being tested. The independent variable in this case is the type of text given to each group of students. At this point, you may have questions or concerns about other elements of this research. For example, you may wonder, what did the students study? Did each sample consist of students that vary in their academic abilities? Did the environments in which students studied vary between groups? If you are pondering these types of questions, that is wonderful, because all of those questions matter and will be addressed in subsequent sections of, of this term to ensure we are engaging in valid and reliable research. 
And that concludes Lecture 1.2 of Chapter 1. Please be sure to complete the Learning Check quiz in the textbook as well in, as in Canvas to assess your comprehension of material covered in Sections 1.1 and 1.2.